You're listening to the Foreign and International Medical Graduate Show, a podcast to inspire physicians in the process of immigration to the United States and access to graduate medical education. We create meaningful and helpful content that motivates medical students and doctors throughout the world with the goal of creating a community that supports itself and gives feedback to each other, that stays updated with the most recent tips and advice on how to make it in America and become a successful resident or fellow in the speciality of your dreams. Dr. Alonso Osorio is board certified and residency trained in both emergency and family medicine and will be bringing you 20 years of his personal experiences, struggles and motivation. We'll be chatting with people like you to talk about the lessons they've learned along their personal path, how to make an impact and how we can all benefit from it. Also, we'll analyze the current resources available and how to benefit from them. Thanks for joining us. Please enjoy the show. Hi, guys. Uh, welcome back to the Foreign International Medical Graduate Podcast. And I have a very interesting topic again. As I promised you in the past, we were hopefully going to bring back Dr. Aneja, and I happened to make it happen. She is an extremely busy inter- in- internist uh, that specializes in infectious diseases here in the Tampa Bay area. And we have been working together for the last uh, several years, and she has been really busy. And finally, she has a little bit of a breather because she's been part of helping us during this pandemic. And she's a frontliner out there helping us throughout the the city of Tampa Bay and many, many, many community hospitals, large hospitals in this area. So welcome back, Dr. Aneja. Thank you for having me, Dr. Osorio. Thank you. No, this this is awesome. Dr. Aneja. There is so much stuff going on these days, so many questions, so many conspiracy theories, so many people that have stopped believing the the doctors, they have stopped believing science, and their sources of information is mostly Facebook, and that's how they're following the trends on what's going on, and they really stop believing us physicians, and I've seen it. They come and they say these ridiculous things to us. Neighbors, friends, relatives have asked you many things. And and I'm really, really fed up about the lack of credibility uh, of the people in general. I mean, that doesn't mean that it's everybody, but seems to be a lot of what's out there. So having said that, that's what I want to do today. Just kind of have an informal discussion, obviously a little scientific based on physician's professional opinion. And I know you have been really busy. Right now, you said that finally you're getting a breather. What it was like at the very beginning when everything started that you started seeing cases throughout the hospitals? What what was it like? A day for you like? What was it like? So in the beginning, I, when you and I first spoke about COVID, it had just started. So yes. actually, we thought that was going to be the worst we could see. But I think after that, things went down. But the second or the second part of that first wave, which we got in the end of May, uh, yeah, towards the end of May, June, uh, all of June, almost all of July, was actually worse than the first time. We had, and I'm sure you saw it in the year, you're the one that faces it first. We had a deluge of patients from the community. We were getting so many sick patients that were from all ages, from you know all backgrounds, there was not a single uh, demographic that was getting affected. There was no correlation between uh, their symptoms and their health status, which is often said. And they were sick if they were sick, and they were they were not. You know, it, it didn't have any correlation. But we were getting families together. We were getting all kinds of patients. But there were times when uh, the hospital would. Just, you know, we were opening unit after unit, especially at our big hospital that you and I work at. Regular medical floors were being converted into COVID units very fast. You know, the the speed with which we had to convert them into appropriate rooms, get the staff ready to see them. Uh, I mean, it it was really something. Uh, We don't, we always prepare for this, but we don't hope that, I mean, we never hope to see this. And that's what happened. An interesting phenomenon that I saw, it's obviously we're afraid of the unknown and that's normal for the humankind and anyone. And me, myself, down in the ER, I was wearing like crazy PPE, double gowning, double gloving, sometimes triple uh, gloving, two, three masks, shields, etc. And the more we learn about the disease process, I continue having precautions. But, you know, 
I have seen this picture from Brad Pitt from the Fight Club that, you know, nurses before and after, before super covered, super protected, and now, you know, after we learn about the disease process, they're almost going bare naked to take care of the fight and fight the virus, which is not the case, but we, we right. do understand the disease process a little bit more. We know what to do. Uh, we wish we had every single room as a negative pressure room, but right now every room has become potentially a COVID room. So the mindset has changed. We have learned the disease process, but I know that as we have gone along, we have learned a lot of, of, uh, of things. What have you learned throughout this process on the behavior of this virus? So I think the virus, and like I said before, the virus is doing what it's meant to do. It's supposed to spread from person to person and wreak havoc and create a pandemic. It's still doing that, you know. It's what I've learned about the behavior of humans, you know, that are enabling the virus. And that's what the problem is. You know, we, we've learned a lot in the medical profession, being in the hospital, being, uh, you know, in the ER, being in the community and as physicians and everybody else, nurses. We have seen what we were doing in the beginning and learned uh, a lot as to how to manage it. There's still so much we don't know about why certain people do what they do and some don't, but at least we know what not to do, you know, including what medicines not to use and what, how to intervene. But what I'm not able to understand and change, unfortunately, is the behavior of people out in the community. And that's what's making this virus so successful in what it's doing. And there's no end in sight because I have never felt, I mean, there's always myths about medicine. You know, you have people... Uh, that come and tell you there'll be a small number of people that don't believe in medicine or don't believe in treatment and they do what they want to do for certain illnesses, right? But this one has compounded to a pandemic of misinformation, I would want to call that, you know, and that's sad because we are fighting with the disease and then we are fighting with the misinformation out there. So the human behavior has come out to be the worst. There are some who are doing whatever they can, the best they can, putting their, them, themselves at risk, they're sacrificing. And then on the other extreme, you have people that are not even willing to make the slightest change in their lifestyle because they think it won't affect them, but they are spreading it to others. And then, you know, that's where the problem is right now. We could have put an end to this a long time ago. I think the behavior here in the United States has been rather selfish by many people. I mean, as you and I have seen now, New Zealand is back to almost normal life and they have had like zero cases in more than 100 days. But when you say the pandemic misinformation has been huge, yesterday I popped uh, open an article from the World Street Journal on how the United States media is considered somehow responsible about misinforming the people about how things are behaving and they're not giving you the objective facts. And, and also, as you said, irresponsible behaviors like Sturgis, the motorcycle rally that is happening as of now, that is hoping to receive thousands and thousands of bikers this weekend that they think that this is all a hoax. Do you, do you think it's a hoax? I'm going to ask you that doctor, this is a hoax, right? (laughs) I mean, if it is hoax, people are doing a great job uniting and pretending. You know, we've seen billions, millions of people pretending in a great way all over the world, you know, to keep the hoax up. I mean, this is this is beyond understanding. And the rally is one thing. But even when we drive around, you don't you see, I mean, restaurants and the beach and people, even in our own communities, they look at it very suspiciously. And I feel like it's not their fault, to be honest. I've been analyzing So if you turn different news channels on, or if you turn different social media sites on, the messaging is so varied depending on what you're listening to, that one person is told one thing and the other person is told one thing and that becomes their truth. So what they're seeing is, oh, my extended family of 100 people, only one got COVID, nobody died. And what this news channel is telling me is it's a hoax and all the doctors and politicians are making this to be a big thing because they want some things to happen. And then that's what they see. While we see the other side and we see everything. And then there's some families who've lost so many family members to COVID. And they're listening to the part which says, yes, this is real. This is. So that's what we are dealing with right now. The ignorance, the, it's almost like a stubbornness where they've associated COVID with their political leaning, with their religious beliefs, with their freedom. I never knew how a mask could represent your freedom. 
I mean, wearing a mask and not wearing a mask is not a sign of freedom or not having it. I don't know how that came about. And that's what scares me because we are living in an era where people are so vulnerable to misinformation. Uh, and that just keeps going on, not just for the virus, but for many things, you know. So to the point where it's almost exhausting when we're working in the ICU, working on the floors and you see patients go bad and then some of them pass away. But then when you leave and you hear people saying, oh, I don't believe it and I'm not going to do, you almost, it's demoralizing. It's very sad. And you almost feel helpless. You know, you don't know what to do. And then you just focus on taking care of those who need you and keep going on. You know, when when you say helpless, I completely understand because some days I have people that are sick and they have horrible x-rays, horrible clinical presentations. They have very poor outcomes. They're cyanotic. They're struggling to breathe. And I have seen a couple die in front of me, but I have also seen the other spectrum. Uh, sniffles, runny nose, I lost my sense of smell. And people ask me, Dr. Osorio, so what are you seeing? I say, I'm seeing a little bit of everything. I mean, okay. how ma and people want to know, but how many are dying? I say, I don't have a specific number based on my personal experience. I tell you, a few are dying, obviously a small percentage, but most of the disease, thank God, for some people, is mild, but I, I don't understand as of yet what is the pathophysiology or how the disease happens that how come some people get it so mild and some people get so sick and sometimes healthy people with no underlying medical conditions. What do you think is that? You know, and that's where the that's where more of more experience will come in. We see the inflammatory pathway go up, the cytokines go up and young, healthy people, they are so quick to respond, their inflammatory like their body fights it, right? So they go into this big phase where everything starts to fight the virus, but it then acts against their own body, right? Their lungs start to get inflamed. We see that underlying comorbidities do affect people. Like if they're already obese or they have underlying uh, lung issues. And you know, the other thing is, which you mentioned, how many people are dying? That question is what I want to focus on. Since when did we start only worrying about dying in this country? You know, the surveys that we do when patients come into the hospital, when they come to your offices, it doesn't ask, did the doctor kill you? Did you die? Right? Mm -hmm. They ask you, how did you feel? How did you get treated? Or even when we are trying to do medical treatments of disease processes, we are trying to make their life better. We're trying to keep the quality of life going. Co coronavirus, COVID, is not a respiratory illness alone that kills or does not kill. It's not the flu. It can cause strokes. We have a person right now who had a stroke on his way home. He had recovered from the virus in the hospital, was getting ready to be discharged. They found him with no movements. You know, he had a stroke. There are people that get blood clots, people whose hearts have enlarged to the point where they have heart failure. They're young people, people who can't walk their normal walk, you know, just for regular activities without feeling short of breath. People who tell me that their joints hurt, people who are having post-traumatic stress, they can't sleep, they're scared, you know, so this is not an illness, which is just, oh, it gets into your lungs, and if you don't get uh, that, then you don't die, so I'll be okay. We don't know, there are so many things, and that's why science evolves. So when people start saying, how many are dying, I've honestly stopped to think, why are they asking me, and I ask them, why does it matter to you how many die? What about the other problems that's, that are happening? And why would you want to take a chance that somebody in your family or your loved one gets infected by you right. and there's a chance they could die? Is that a chance you want to take? I mean, even if it's just about dying. So I don't want COVID because I don't know which spectrum I'll end up on. You know, we don't know. So that's where I think the disconnect is. And people are, and I'm starting to think, is it because it's very hard to, do this. It's very hard to give up on certain things in your life, you know, to not go out, to not be normal. Are they in denial or have they accepted it? Or is it really not knowing? That's where I'm struggling right now. You know, as a physician, as a human, I mean, it's difficult. <laughs> it is super difficult. And I have seen, for example, my kid's pediatrician, she said, Alonso, uh, despite all the proper precautions, I don't know where I caught it. I think it was from my husband because the first thing that he had is I, I, he lost the sense of smell, but it's been six weeks since I went through this. And Alonso, I need to be seen because I have this overwhelming chest tightness. I can barely move. I talk for like five minutes and I feel that I have run a marathon 
Every single joint of my body hurts. So we came, we assessed her, we were looking for a PE, we were looking for other complications, and she's finally getting better. We're, but we're talking two months after. Imagine the, the, the fear for your life, the, the lack of quality of life. I also have a nurse's husband that has been walking around with a, a oxygen for the last three weeks. You know, I have a friend who's actually a firefighter, a very healthy person who's never had any medical issues. You know, he got COVID uh, while taking care of somebody that he was, you know, on call. he was on call. So he went to somebody's place and he was fine. But then one day he said he could barely walk from his car to his uh, fire station. So he went uh, and then other people in his group were sick too. Went to the hospital, his oxygenation's fine. They couldn't find anything wrong with his numbers, but he just cannot get over this feeling that he can't breathe. And when he checks his oxygen, it's 90, 92, but that shortness of breath where he feels like he's done, you know, an hour of workout or he's actually climbed up so many stairs. He's not able to go back to normal functioning. It's two months. And his biggest fear, and he's got tested so many times already. He's still positive. But the biggest fear he shares with me is, I don't want to leave my children and my wife behind. You know, and that, that anxiety, why do we want that? You know, even if he'll end up being fine. I know I've been looking at him, looking at his numbers. Everything will be okay. Eventually he'll get better. But when there is an easy way to prevent that from happening to us in our life, why can we just not do that? You know, why risk it? Um, and we need to all go back to normal. I mean, I want to go back to normal. I want to be able to get my kids to school. I want to walk into the hospital and you too, where we don't have to wear N95s again. We don't have to wear the PPE. You know, we could go hug our patients like we used to, hold their hands, you know, be normal again. Since, since you say that, uh, I, I, I washed my hands and I went to see this lady and I felt like literally giving her a handshake and a hug because I was about to drop the news that she I found metastatic pancreatic cancer on her. She just came for simple abdominal pain. And, and we talk about her diagnosis. Obviously, I'm not a, an oncologist. And I told her, I'm sorry. And we gave a hug. And she started crying. And she said, oh, my God, it's so nice to feel again another human being uh, touching me. And that really gave me the goosebumps because it's that feeling, that connection, that need to be close to others and hug or uh, shake hands is so much needed. I know. And then our kids, you know, my daughter who's young, she is in elementary school and she woke up one morning and she said, I dreamt that we are back in school and uh, none of us are wearing masks. And I started freaking out. I said, you know, that could have been a good dream, but it ended up being a nightmare for her. So she was hoping that that's okay. But then she started getting scared. My son says, I wish we could go back where we could sit and have lunch and recess together. We could play basketball. We could hang out with each other, you know, and everybody's like, Oh, so let's send them to school because that's what they need. But there's a big question mark. Is it safe? So to, in, order to, in order to ensure that, we all have to do the right thing. We just have to make sure we wear masks, we use the proper precautions to cut this down. So at the end, that will become reality again. You know, we will go back to normal. So our kids both go to the same school, mm-hmm. a private school here in town. And I think we've been exchanging and postponing the interview because we thought that they were going back yesterday and they didn't now postpone it to next Monday or the Monday after. So based on the data and based on Hillsborough County, specifically here in this part of the Tampa Bay area where we are, do you think, it, this is what parents are asking me, do you think it's safe to send kids back to school? Some people are saying, I am not making my child a laboratory rat expecting them to get sick and bring the disease process to me. What, what's your point on the decision of sending your kids? And are you sending your kids? So I can talk for myself. Okay. And that's based on, and I've been examining my reasoning because my husband and I are both infectious disease doctors. We are working in COVID units. Is our decision based because we see all the sick people or is it based on what we are seeing in community? And I think we really examined our fears. We addressed it with ourselves and we spoke to our kids and we came to the conclusion that we are not sending them to school in the beginning. We are doing the virtual school from home because to be honest, my son is good. He's older. He's in middle school to wear a mask. You know, he can wear the face shield as he wants. I don't know about other friends that will do it or not, but at least he will do his part. But my daughter, who's in elementary school, has trouble wearing her mask all day. 
even us when we are working, you know, it's so hard for us to not do what we are so inclined to do, touching our face. Like, you know, we want to get off the mask. So she couldn't do it. I walked with her the other day. She just couldn't do it. So I decided for me, I think it's safer to keep them at home, especially because we have the privilege that we can keep them at home. We can do virtual schooling. We have people that can take care of them and see how it goes in the beginning. Parents have decided to send their kids to school and I'm okay with their decision. I'm sure they looked at their children. They looked at their risks and benefits and they came to their own conclusion because most parents that we send our kids to school with, they're all educated. They come from a different background. So their needs and their decisions are based on their situation. So I'm okay with their decision, but I want to see how it goes in the beginning. And um, we're actually meeting people and we're going to make more streamlined process for school to make it safer for the children. And once that happens, we'll see how it goes. But I still go back to the same meme on Facebook. If schools are not able to control lice, how do you control COVID? Wow, that's a good one. That was just a joke I saw. And I was like, that's so true. I cannot imagine uh, elementary age kids, you know, when they're in recess, not wearing their masks, uh, which is going to happen staying away from each other, you know, not coughing on one another. And it's not them. They might get sick. They might get very sick from COVID. There are children who get very sick or they may just bring it home or will they spread it to their teachers? We don't know because when, when they studied children, that was when there was a lockdown. Most of the world was at home. So children, we don't have much data on them. If it's just going to be what the politicians are telling us, oh, it's nothing, kids are okay. I'll believe them when I see it. You know, right now we don't know. And I'm, I think the difference between physicians and scientists and politicians and people that don't know science is a scientist is willing to say, I don't know. A doctor is willing to say, I don't know when I don't know something. While people that don't know anything are the ones that tell you, I am 100% sure of this. So I'm not taking their word. I'm going to wait and see. So my kids are not going to school. But, you know, let's see. Maybe in a month or so how things are. Yeah. That That's a very good answer. And sometimes Patients look at you with the eyes blown open because as a doctor, they think you know everything. And when sometimes they come in with symptoms that don't explain a disease process, I tell them, so what do you think is going on? And you look at them and you say, I just don't know. I'm sorry. Every test, every single test that I run in you is normal, but I just don't know. They look at you like you were a unicorn, uh, some some weird type of person. But that I think that I said honest questions because we don't know everything and more with this disease process. We don't know everything. So looking back, doing the research, studies that are getting published, literature that is being coming out there, uh, where are we standing on hydroxychloroquine as of now, Dr. Aneha, changing the topic and talking a little bit more about science? Where are we standing on that? Uh, in the beginning, we were using it. Like, you know, it was part of all our COVID protocols. We were using it as, uh, as much as we could. But in our oath, we all took it. We say, first, do no harm. And we use evidence to use drugs in every aspect, not just COVID, but anything that we use. We use evidence based on trials. And in pandemics, unfortunately, sometimes it's not available to us, but we look and see if a drug is working and then we weigh it against the risks and benefits, right? Like right now we are using remdesivir. We are using that drug, even though we don't know uh, long-term what's happening, even though it's been approved by the FDA because it works. But then as we use hydroxychloroquine, and there were, I don't know why only hydroxychloroquine is addressed. There were five other drugs on our protocol, which we are not using anymore either. Ivermectin was one of them. Kaletra was one of them. We were using HIV antivirals. You know, they were telling us to use all these other uh, experimental drugs. We've stopped using those in addition to hydroxychloroquine. But for some reason, hydroxychloroquine has stayed on and it just doesn't seem to leave conversations. We stopped using it just like those other drugs because we saw no benefit. It wasn't really helping. And not just in our own practice, but all the studies that came, and there were many studies showing that the risks to patients from all of these drugs were worse than the benefits. So if you tell me that hydroxychloroquine works in COVID, and then there is a risk, I'll still weigh it and use it, right? But if it doesn't work, and all it does is harm somebody, I'm not going to use it. No matter who tells me, no matter... What they do, that's how we work. So that's exactly why many of these medicines are not being used right now, including hydroxychloroquine. And I just want to keep on repeating that, that in the beginning, we had seven drugs on that protocol. All of them are gone. And wow. 
some reason, this one medicine keeps just coming back. And I think that is because humans are suspicious, you know, and then when they're being told by one person not to trust some of us, which is again disheartening because we don't work based on who we vote for, right? We work based on who you vote for. I treat you based on what your disease is. I don't even ask. Nobody asks me. I wouldn't work that way ever. So when they accuse physicians or scientists or epidemiologists of doing things that we would never think we would do, then it becomes very disheartening. But I'm not using hydroxychloroquine. I don't plan on using it any time in the future unless, say, next year a groundbreaking study with evidence, with evidence, with randomized control trials comes out telling us it does work, maybe then. But I don't see that happening because all the studies that have come out so far are pretty robust against it. And the couple that said it works were very poorly designed. They had a lot of flaws in them. And people who know how to read studies would agree with me and they would say, yes, that those studies are flawed. And many experts have weighed in on it. So I think we need to get over the hydroxychloroquine bandwagon. What about the patients? What about the patients walking in telling me that I need the CPAC or acetromycin? Uh, But they always ask for that. They ask for CPAC no matter what. It's the the most powerful antiviral that I have known in the history of humankind. So no, I don't use that anymore either. I mean, they were using it at the beginning with hydroxychloroquine. I, in fact, we look at their numbers and uh, purely from an infection standpoint, if they don't have evidence of a bacterial process, there is no role for antibiotics in this disease. Yeah, what patients say, my doctor always gives me a CPAC because it dries me up. It, yep. it takes care of my congestion. So anyway, <laughs> let's go back to a little bit of epidemiology. I had a friend of mine that his wife uh, is an epidemiologist and she worked uh, with a prominent university across the United States at some point in time. Right now, she's a uh, stay-home wife. And she said the following to, to him and he related this to me. Alonso, I think what we're really facing right now is the third wave. And here's what he says. I think the first wave is that one that you and I saw late December, early January, that we were seeing a large amount of people walking through fast track with severe respiratory symptoms. They were nonstop. They were hacking. They were coughing. They had kind of x-rays that showed pneumonia bilaterally, and we treated them as pneumonia, and we discharged them. The problem was that we were not testing, so we missed that wave. Second wave was the famous New York Seattle wave that was devastating, and we all know about that one. And then I think that one came towards Florida. And then that this wave, I'm calling it the third wave. And I think it's fading away finally, hopefully. But I think there's going to be potentially a fourth peak that is about to come with the kids returning to school, the life, quote unquote, going back to normal, and the flu season coming along. Do you believe that this is possibly an epidemiologic behavior that we can see or is just a normal disease process based on viral replication? No, I think I agree with your friend because um, we did see those unexplained pneumonias, unexplained bilateral interstitial diseases, uh, which looked like somebody was vaping, you know, like that kind of inflammation in their lungs. Their flu tests were negative. Their respiratory panels were negative. Their procalcit- the numbers that tell us it's a bacterial process was also negative. And some of them, I remember clearly one woman who told me she cannot taste her food at all. And I couldn't explain it back then. This was in late December, actually. So we don't know. And we saw a bunch of those. And then miraculously, the flu started disappearing sometime in February. We stopped seeing the flu. And that usually happens when another virus is coming up, right? The flu goes. So I, I, it could be. I mean, it could be that we're looking at this, but it's not over. That I can tell you. And what people are doing today will show us four weeks from now what, what's going to happen. Uh, am I waiting for that? No. Am I ready? No, I'm tired. But we'll have to be ready for it. Yeah. So I, I bet that you get asked this all the time. I'm going to put you on the spot. So Dr. Aneha, when do you think this virus will be gone forever? When people start doing what they're supposed to do and they wear masks and they do the distancing and they act responsibly and actually care about another person and not just themselves, it'll go. Do you think we have developed some sort of immunity? I don't know the answer to that because they're saying that some people have, there was that one patient that said he got it again. I don't know if that's true or if it was just a testing and it was a prolonged shedding. Some of us may have, 
just because of where we work, you know, we may have been exposed to it at some point and I'm hoping I'm immune to it. I don't know. We didn't get the antibody testing as it's not as easy to get tested as you know. So, uh, you know, again, time will tell. And if there is an immunity out there, that is a good uh, indicator for a vaccine then, you know, and uh, hopefully that will be something we can look into too, but I'm not holding my breath about any of this. All I know is it will be back. We just have to be ready and uh, we'll see how it goes. Now, about testing, how sensitive or specific is the antibody testing and how reliable is it is as of now on what the quality of the testing that we are providing out there? Just the antibody testing to see if you were ever infected. Yeah, the antibody testing, different uh, sources have made it. And I don't think it's a very reliable test right now. We're not seeing a very reliable uh, outcome. That's why it hasn't become as prevalent as it should have. You know, the test, that would have really helped us. But testing by itself, you know, has been a problem in COVID. So once we get the antibody test, um, which is really helpful and will give us an idea of the actual prevalence in society, we can all make informed decisions. That's when we'll know, is it safe to go back to the movie theaters? Is it safe to open school normally? Is it safe to cohort a certain group of individuals who are negative and then the positives can do? You know, so there's so much more to be done and so much more we should be doing uh, that the antibody test is not something I would hang my hat on right now. Now, regarding the testing itself, I know that some people said, okay, I tested positive today. I was sick for about two weeks they're not allowing me to return to work until I get a negative test. To be honest with you, I don't think that that makes sense at all, but some individual workplaces have created a personal policy that you are not allowed to come back to work until you have a negative test. How are you managing this when people are asking you for, quote, clearance to return to work? But that has changed, actually. In fact, in the beginning, we thought that was actually a good thing, but many people were not adhering to that. They were letting people come back when they shouldn't have and they were actively sick. Uh, and now the, based on what the CDC is saying and everybody else, if you're symptom free, you go back to work. You know, you, you only stay away when you have symptoms and they're not asking for negative tests in a lot of places. And in the places that they do, I don't do the clearance part because of my practice, but I do know that certain individual physicians have written that these are long shedders and I've helped them with that. That the 14 day number, we don't know how people came up with that. Some people are positive. They're, they're still shedding maybe inactive virus for 60 days, for 90 days, you know. That doesn't mean that they should not go back to work. Or the other way to look at it is, could you be, just wear a mask and follow precautions and go back to work, which would be a better thing. So uh, that's what we do, case by case basis, you know. I mean, in healthcare, people are coming back to work within a few days too, right? If they're not, and if they're asymptomatic, they continue to work, even if they have it. So I think that's how it's going right now. Along this line, uh, do you think that we are rushing to make a vaccine? Do you think we're putting too much effort onto this and probably it's not going to be the solution for it all? No, I think rushing is good. We are trying to get the vaccine and I hope everything starts to move quickly like with research, but we shouldn't rush to clear the vaccine. Like we should do the adequate trials and testing. Um, Like we heard about this, the Russia vaccine that they have, you know, we don't know. All that has to be taken with a pinch of salt. I mean, if we follow all the protocols and find safety and efficacy, yeah, we should. But time will tell, you know, whether it works or not. Let's go back to your personal uh, life experience. What has been your life for the last eight months? What are, how long have been your days? I know that you are having early mornings, lengthy days, long clinic hours. What is it like for you for an infectious disease specialist in the U.S. right now? So I am not doing much clinic. We are doing telemedicine in the hospital. I mean, there's no end, as you know. Right now, it's a little better this week, I, I want to say. But the whole night, we would just be talking and watching these patients because they go south very quick. You know, their, their oxygen level drops. They start getting hypoxic and requiring things and you need to intervene. So it's been where they were coming in in so many great numbers that by the time you finish seeing all of them, there's a whole new set of people that are waiting for you, you know? So you just keep going, basically. You just keep going from one patient to another, then you kind of triage them saying, this one is stable right now, so let me go and see the one that's not stable. And then it's a teamwork. So some of my colleagues, like the pulmonary doctor and I, we would divvy up our list and say, 
You start from the side, I'll start from there, you know, and then we keep putting orders in as we go and seeing them and, and people don't understand. It sounds simple, but when you're actually donning and doffing, which is wearing your PPE, then making sure it's all on, going into those rooms and they can't hear you and the patients can't understand you and they can't see you, going through all those barriers of communication because it's loud in there with the, with the, with the blowers, you know, with the, and with the negative pressure. And then there's too many tubes and they have the heated high flow. I mean, those rooms are not meant for a good interaction between any of us, right? We don't get, they don't get to see me smile or see my expressions on my face. All of us are covered. You get out of that room, you doff, you, meaning you take off all your PPE, then it's time for the next one. So you clean everything, then you get back in the next room. Multiply that a few... 50 times a day. Right, right. Uh, it's physically exhausting. It's mentally because you feel helpless when you see some of those patients and you're like, what can I do to make them better? Because as physicians, we are trained and we are inclined to get everybody better. That's what we do, right? We are healers. We are supposed to make them better. But when you see them and there's so little you can offer some of them who are not doing well or they're just so miserable, even with everything we give them, they're going through the disease process where it really racks their heart, their chest, their body's aching, they're shivering, they're febrile, and you don't know what you can do to help them, right? And they're, they're scared because they're in that room by themselves. So those days and those nights are exhausting. They take a toll on us. We come home to our families. We can't hug our children when we come home. They're waiting for us. And then you're back to, you know, you're chatting. You're then looking at patients. You get a call about one patient from a nurse. Then there's new patients you've admitted from the ER. And then we are looking at them because each one is in a different stage. It's, it's a very, it's a, it's a phenomenon, which is like a disaster, right? You're, you're trained for that, but you don't want to do it. So it takes a toll on all of us. And then there's that underlying fear. We are vulnerable. I don't want to get sick when I'm taking care of these patients. I'm human. I don't want to bring it home to my children, you know, and we all talk about it and we all discuss that amongst each other. And then every so often, every day almost, we hear about some colleague or somebody we know in the hospital that got sick. I've had a couple of people I know who were very close to me pass away last week. Uh, One of them was an IM physician who worked with us, internal medicine, and he was working till he got infected with COVID and struggled for his life, couldn't make it. So, you know, then those things take, but you don't have the luxury of time. You don't have an outlet because then you have to keep moving on to the next patient. And when you come home or you look at social media or you hear the news, they're calling it a hoax. They're telling us doctors are doing this because, you know, they have a hidden agenda or they don't want to give you hydroxychloroquine because this so-and-so doesn't want to believe in it. It's very disheartening. But then you... Look back, you know, you pray, you take a deep breath. I come, I I take a shower, I take that time to calm down, eat, cook, you know, and you get back for another day. So (laughs) what you have said so far is that the mass has not killed you as of yet because people say this is suffocating me and the carbon monoxide concentrations in my blood are going (laughs) off the hook and I'm self-poisoning myself. Uh, I had an N95 all day with a face shield and goggles. Uh, the only thing it does to me is I sweat a lot, and I'm sure you do, and we can't drink enough water, but we do it. And masks don't kill, actually. I mean, a lot of surgeons would have died while operating a long time ago, you know. These brain surgeons that have spent 10 hours, 12 hours, 14 hours standing wearing full PPE masks, you know. Yeah. I don't know where they come with these ideas. And many people have proven, actually, through videos and individual right. experiences so, that having the mask is the best thing that you can do to protect yourself and protect the others, right? So Dr. Fossey or Fossey, uh, I don't know how they pronounce it in America. Coming into the United States, I read one book for internal medicine called The Principles of Internal Medicine, The Harrisons. He has been one of the editors in chief for this book for decades. And it's like a Bible for you, an internist, is your Bible, uh, for a general practitioner was a source of reference for diseases process. So he has become a very interesting character. And I think it's extremely knowledgeable, but he, people are also plotted against him. What do you think has been his role? And how do you see Dr. Fosch's roles thus far during the pandemic? Has he been good? Is he saying proper things? Uh, I don't know, maybe it's too much to ask to to speak about a colleague, but just your opinion, gentle, professional opinion. 
know, Dr. Foshi, I mean, he's also a fellow infectious disease physician like I am. And he's always been, even when I was growing up in India and the HIV pandemic, we knew his name even before we went to medical school. We saw his face. He writes our books. He leads us. I was training in infectious disease in, uh, when the H1N1 pandemic happened, which didn't go as bad because he was leading and we did well. The Ebola virus, the, all the other Zika, everything. And things we don't even know about that they must be doing because they do what they're supposed to do. They, ha- they look at what's happening. They look at emerging infections and they take care of them. I think his leadership is beyond doubt. His approach is beyond doubt. He is who he is. He's a very knowledgeable, humble, soft-spoken man. He is not a politician. He is not a person that plays a part and sensationalizes things because he's not out there trying to create drama, right? That's not what physicians do. That's not what scientists do. He speaks the facts. He speaks them without any added emotion is what I would say. He states them for what they are. I did see emotion when he was confronted by falsities when he was, uh, you know, having to dis- give a deposition or something when he was talking to Congress. I remember that. And I saw that fire. And that only comes when a truthful person has been pushed to his mm-hmm. limit. You know, it, it's his personality. I can't imagine myself <laughs> sitting there trying to be calm. I mean, each person's different. And sometimes do you want him to speak up louder and be angry? But that's not who he is. He's given up his entire life. I mean, the guy could have retired a long time ago, right? He could be living off on some property, on a yard somewhere, right? Retirement. He didn't do that. He's still serving. He's a public servant. He's putting himself at risk. And now even more, not just with the disease, but with security to his family and everybody, by this group of misinformed people who I know, I hope, but I know for a fact are in the minority. They're loud, but there are very few of them. It's most of us, we believe in Dr. Fauci, regardless of who they vote for. I have a lot of friends, a lot of people that I talk to, who, even though they may not agree with him, like from a political standpoint, if they only thought about it from their person who they vote for or whatever, but they listen to him. Because at the end, facts are facts, science is science. And I think he's done a good job so far. Was he muffled for some time? Yes. But those of us who wanted to listen to him still heard him, right? We heard what he said. And he was able to get his message across. Uh, So I think he has done a tremendous job of balancing it and still managed to get his message across by playing, you know, the way it's supposed to be. I mean, he could have done it in an angry manner and lost his platform to speak. So I think he stayed on and he did this because of a sense of, sense of duty. He's just staying on because he wants to make sure all of us will be okay. So that's my salute to Dr. Farshi, who's our guru. He's, you know, actually speaking to all of us on the 15th of August, he's doing a CME lecture for the uh, Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. So, I mean, if you want, I'll send you the link. So oh, yeah. it's a webinar. So all of us are going to do that. So yeah, there's no doubt. Physicians are physicians. They shouldn't be forced, or scientists shouldn't be forced to play politics. And that's when it becomes a dangerous game. So. Wow. Yeah. Talking about politics and one of our very last few questions. Do you think what people are saying that the government and Trump is manipulating the statistics that we're uh, either under-reporting or over-reporting the amount of cases. How do, how do you think, what's, what's the glitch here or what's the people's concern? What do you think about that? What's your opinion on that? It's, it's statistics manipulation. So there are two things, right? At first, when it was a high number, the other side was saying, oh, the statistics are manipulated. Now they're saying it's manipulated from the other side. So I'm hoping that nobody can manipulate statistics. The truth is we are not testing as much as we should. So the numbers are low because of that. But, you know, when the numbers started going down on the statistics, we also saw a decrease in patients here. So I'm so far, you know, correlating that with what's happening. Uh, But to be very honest with you, I try to keep myself as unbiased as possible when I look at data. And I'm hoping that in the end, science and facts will always prevail. If you take off the political, either left, right, whichever side, if you take off all that, the facts will still remain. And that's what we should focus on. So I think we should be okay. And let's see what happens when the new wave comes, you know? Hope it doesn't. And, oh my God, Lord Jesus. And here, I'm going to throw you a final bomb. Uh, this one is going to be something that I get asked. Do you think that the Chinese virus was man-made? Do you think that this was a biologic weapon? I asked me this question before too in our last time. And my answer is still the same. I don't think so. I mean, they've, uh, even Dr. Fauci, everybody looked at it. 
They said it's, there is no evidence. So when somebody tells me there is no evidence, it means they looked for it. They couldn't find it. So it's over. You know, this is not a code of law where you can try to question some things. There is no evidence. There is no evidence. I'm not going to sit and waste my time about that. It's here. <laughs> Got it. And one last thing, uh, a dear friend of my brother, uh, contact me via uh, Facebook Messenger and said, I want to know which is the protocol that you're currently using in the management of COVID. And I told her, well, I wouldn't say that there is a protocol by itself. I think it's an ever-changing dynamic process in which we adapt and target the treatment based on the clinical scenario and underlying comorbidities. And she was arguing or just requesting to establish all this treatment protocol with zinc, vitamin C, and remdesivir, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, to her significant other. And I understand where she's coming from. She's meaning well. But uh, what is your cocktail mix or your protocol that you're using or how are you approaching these cases? I think you answered it best. What you said is what I would say. Uh, There is no cocktail. There is no written Medicine is never like that. We don't follow one algorithm. Um, we practice clinical diagnosis and clinical treatment. So I think you said it best. So. Cool. Well, there you go, guys. Dr. Aneha has given us a full hour of her time. And this is more, I think this podcast today is more informative, more relaxed, not as technical, not as scientific. The goal is to reach the community and the people, not only the doctors, and to educate because... I don't think uh, we have seen too many infectious disease specialists really talking about it. And and I wanted to hear from her for a foreign medical graduate now in the United States with with kids with a normal life. But uh, she's also a mother, a colleague, and we really appreciate everything that you have done. And despite the fact that I'm leaving my my current job, I hope that in the future uh, we stay in touch either through work or texting or hopefully I will never get to see you as a patient myself. I know, and I hope I never end up in your ER, Alonso. <laughs> so, no, we'll be in touch. I mean, we are on all the time together. So, yeah, and we'll best of luck with everything and stay safe, everyone. This has been so valuable. Dr. Aneha, thank you again. God bless you all. And thank you for listening to the podcast. Please share this. That is so juicy, full of goodness. And remember, sharing is caring. God bless you.